Be a flying monkey so I can just get huge airs coming nine foot out of the sky. You know how it is. In 1995, just four years after inline skating had become the fastest growing participation sport in human history, the first X Games made its way into households across America. While millions of people were already familiar with the idea of rollerblading as a recreational activity, the X Games was the first time most viewers ever saw the sport that was then known as aggressive inline skating. It's aggravated, you know when you gotta blow out some steam. Just go and invert it, like, bam! 
getting those huge airs and just having a book, having a blast. You know what I mean? Yeah. For such a young sport, getting so much exposure was seen as a triumph. Testimony to the sport's longevity and tidings of widespread public acceptance. But what no one seemed to expect was public backlash from the freshly formed action sports community. We were invited to come to the first X Games, and I don't think many of us were ready for it. And I came from a skateboard background, and I remember getting off the tour bus, coming into the dorms, and walking into the lobby and seeing Danny Way and Tuss Bapas, these guys, you know, I, as a little skateboard dude, looked up to them, you know, and I remember them just grilling us. The first time I ever heard anyone called a food booter was right then. It's just kind of a weird thing, because back in Atlanta, my friends were skateboarders that I grew up skateboarding and rolling with. Like, there was just no hate. Critics saw a young, unrefined sport attempting to pass itself off as a legitimate lifestyle alongside cultures nearly 20 years its senior. Sport is so young, I don't know if the inliners get the significance, let's say, of a competition like this. Whereas the BMXers, the skateboarders, they've been doing this for so long, it's more like a business trip, kind of comparing, let's say, a college football team on a road trip or the 49ers. Yeah, I mean, Matt Hoffman, and skateboarding Tony Hawk, these guys have made big bucks in business in line, not quite the same thing. Because rollerblading has its roots and is on the same terrain as skateboarding and biking, it's kind of like we started out without our own true identity. It's kind of looked at as we're kind of posing off that, biting off that. And so really in the beginning, I mean, we were totally doing our own thing, but it was on someone else's terrain that was already created. In the post-homie don't play that world of 1995, a crucial time in the development of the modern concept of posers or fakes, rollerblading became the most famous poser symbol of all, the Folex of action sports. Skateboarders decided we bit their scene and let everyone know. After that, it was like nothing rollerblading could do allowed it to escape the constant vigil of skateboarding's shadow. BMXers got two wheels, skateboarders got four. We've got eight wheels. Do the math, asshole. We took the best of surfing, skateboarding, and BMX, and then we just dwarfed those bozos. Blading the edge. Men, get in line. And the rest has been history. The resulting stigma essentially erased the positive exposure rollerblading had earned itself replacing it instead with the tendency to be discredited. Now, 11 years after the first X Games, rollerblading finds itself fighting a war for survival that has inadvertently created the very history it was discredited for lacking. We're in the young stage. We're getting back to the bottom because you got to fix the foundation and work with the basics and make sure that all that is ready and secure. This is the story of a global community of athletes unified by a common interest. This is what it's like being a rollerblader. Being part of a group that some critics really do wish was barely dead. Now the energies have shifted. Now it's, it's gone underground and it's gotten stronger and better than ever before. So many rollerbladers cite the X Games as the source of their interest in blading that it's as good a place to start as any. And it's a good story, too, because what almost no one knows is that the X game exists in many parts thanks to the early popularity of rollerblading, a point which deserves some exploration. Yeah, 1994 was the first official street course contest put on by NIST National Inline Skate Series. It got the TV psyched on filming skate contests. Rollerblading was popping off big and, and growing crazy at that point. And so that's, when, that's where they got the whole idea to bring this to the X Games type deal and have skateboarding and BMX and all that because the rollerblading contest did so well on TV. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. And yes, rollerblading was a big part of the inaugural X Games and getting it off the ground. The X Games getting off the ground in 1995 was no accident. Skateboarding, freestyle BMX, snowboarding, wakeboarding, and other assorted sports, soon to be given the uber generic umbrella title of action sports, are at relative plateaus suddenly rollerblading enters the horizon with millions of new skaters. National Sporting Goods Association statistics put inline participation at nearly 24 million. At the same time, skateboarding 4.5 million, snowboarding 3.8 million. There was no comparison. Inline had exploded and all that money had to go somewhere. Turns out the X Games got a chunk of it too and has gone on to change the cultural identity of youth the world over.
There is no better recruiting tool than something that gets out to millions and millions of people. It may not be the most credible thing. That's our job. Once they get exposed to it, we got to be there to catch them, let them come into our culture, and then let them sort of get an education. For BMX athletes of the early 90s, it was a period when sponsors were dropping riders and going out of business. The magazines were on their way out, and it appeared as if BMX and its culture was about to be lost. But it didn't go anywhere. Some people like Spike Jones made the move from BMX magazine to directing music videos, while others like Jess Dierenforth, then a professional writer for GT, was left with a choice. Head back to England, or cut loose and keep fighting for a piece of the American dream. He chose the latter, a decision that directly contributed to the future path of rollerblading. But it sounds a lot better when he tells it. Back in the late 80s, I remember one day a guy named Doug Boyce showed up and he was on rollerblades. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm into. I thought it was kind of cool and tech that the wheels were on a line, but I really had no attraction or desire to ever try him out. But something about his style caught my eye and I was like, wow, you know what? This guy's really taken something and really I don't know, he's kind of adapted it, you know, and really morphed it into something different. He didn't represent anything that I'd experienced with rolling. Rolling had this very uncool image back then. He used to be a professional skateboarder, and he'd skateboard a little bit, and he'd rollerblade a little bit, and he was just completely confident. They take other elements of other sports and adapt them into the sport, but it is its own sport. It has, it has eight wheels in a line, you know, and you're gonna have to figure out how to use those on your feet, you know. There was a change in, in, the, in the BMX industry. The, the sport itself was very much alive, but the industry did take a dive and, 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 and a lot of companies started disappearing. A lot of the companies sold to larger corporations and those co corporations then looked at a company like GT Bikes and said, well, you guys aren't meeting your numbers, we're gonna start cutting back budgets, you know, marketing, team budgets, everything. Professional riders kind of had to sort out different careers. And so I went to ASR trade show in San Diego, early 89, and I saw a roller bait demo and there was the whole dance team with the spandex, you know, doing the whole hip hop thing, whatever. And I was kind of watching it, you know, tongue in cheek kind of thing. I didn't really know what to think about it. And all of a sudden, I mean, there's this half pipe there, so that's what kind of caught my attention. And this guy comes out on rollerblades, Chris Edwards, and he starts doing, I think, I mean, it's probably only like five foot, six foot airs. But I was just like, wow. And his style, he was compact, you know, he looked really solid, you know, and, and he was doing 540s, and I was just like kind of blown away by that. And I had a lot of respect because I knew that he had probably dealt with a lot of stigma issues, especially at ASR. Back then it was like the coolest trade show. It was like all the hip stuff, surf, skateboarders. I mean, it was such a clicky trade show. And all of a sudden this guy's on rollerblades and everyone's kind of looking at him. They don't know what to think about him. And so I ended up doing demos with him about a month later and he was on the half pipe and I was on my bike and he just was in my face like the whole day. Jess, you gotta try this out, man. You gotta try these blades out. They're amazing. I was like, no, I don't think so. And after one of the demos, he, get, he said, you gotta do it. I was like, all right, whatever. I went around the parking lot and I was kind of all over the place. It felt very unnatural. And, uh, and then I went on the, on the ramp and all of a sudden it just had this different flow to it. You know, there was something really smooth and fluid and fast about it. And he vowed after that day to get me a pair of skates. Before I knew it, I was kind of leaving my bike at home and going to the skate park with my with my rollerblades. And so that's really, it really wasn't a conscious thing. It's something that just kind of naturally happened. And at the, simultaneously, the, the, the BMX industry really had lost its spark. I mean, it, it, was, it was in a lull, but unlike rollerblading, there, there wasn't anything going on at that time. But all of a sudden I had this medium with rollerblades. It was this open kind of blank canvas where everything that I'd learned from, from my skateboarding background and from my BMX background was being adapted towards rollerblades. It boggles me to think, you know, how did I end up here, like, on, the, on this whole journey that we've all been on? You start to think about how you actually got to the point where you're at. To start at the beginning, let's go back to Holland in the 1700s, where a Dutch man who preferred ice skating as his transportation of choice created the first dry land skates. Unfortunately, the exact name of this visionary is lost, but not Jean-Joseph Merlin. He went on to become the first recorded skate inventor by demonstrating a primitive inline skate with metal wheels in 1760. That's right, 1760. Ten years before Europeans even discovered the Polynesian surfing, a Dutch gentleman had invented an inline skate. Later during the 1800s, James Leonard Plimpton, a resident of New York City, came up with the first incarnation of the modern quad roller skate. His idea was so successful that it led William Bone, another Englishman, 
patent a design for the wheels of roller skates before later filing the patent for a ball or roller bearing race that would go on to be used for bicycle and carriage wheels. The roller skate underwent many improvements over the next hundred years, like the invention of polyurethane wheels which added speed, stability, and durability. And then it can be argued that the next major revolution for the roller skate came in the 1950s, when surfers began taking the axles off of roller skates and putting them on planks of wood, accidentally creating skateboarding. Who'd have guessed the pursuit of wheeled freedom, particularly innovations created by inline skates, could lead to so much mechanical progression and modern-day cultural influence? And more importantly, why haven't you heard more about it? The first modern inline skate started as an off-season hockey training tool credited to the Olsen brothers, who based their design on existing incarnations of earlier inline skates. This was 1980. It comes as a surprise to some people to know that Rollerblade has been in business since 1980. We were the first company to successfully produce and market inline skates. The Rollerblades quickly gained popularity with snow skiers, hockey players, and yes, ice figure skaters. Welcome to Skate to Ski, a program that can show you how to use your rollerblade inline skate to become a better skier. Because of this, rollerblade skates were popular right from the get-go, but only in isolated, often affluent pockets. What actually brought it into the shop was Scott Olson came in and begged us to carry them. At that time, they were advertising a lot in the magazines for skiing, but it was the early 80s. You know, the sport of inline skating has been growing in popularity over the past few years. By 1986, inline skating was a $7 million a year industry, but more growth was on the way. Mom says they're free falling to nowhere, but skaters say they're moving fast into the future. Inline skaters and their moms face off. When the creators of rollerblade skates took their product out to the masses, they did so at the beach with demo teams. These people were there to wow the crowd with their moves and then put the crowd on wheels. To date, this has been proven the most effective method for creating new rollerbladers. The biggest boom for rollerblade skates has been the wide acceptance of the skates as a recreational product used for both fitness and fun, not necessarily in that order. I'm just amazed that I don't see more of the uh, big corporate CEOs cruising the parking lot with the rollerblades on because if they did, they'd have a much easier and much more profitable day. Using the beaches of Florida and Southern California as a backdrop to the lifestyle of choice for athletic Americans looking for light fun, Rollerblade planted their roots in some of the most culturally eclectic soil around. It's like anyone can get into it for their own travel. As a breeding ground for new trends, Southern California was a particularly powerful catalyst in the evolution of rollerblading's popularity. Here, it found a place amongst the colorful locals as a tool for transportation and self-expression. By 1991, inline skating was a $200 million a year industry. And while on paper it looked like everything was going well, Rollerblade and the other skate manufacturing corporations would soon be baffled by the rise of a small but dedicated and vocal group of inline skaters that were truly interested in embracing all the potential of an inline skate. Slowly, a rift formed that would lead to a conscious rebellion by this minority against the image that had until then been attributed to inline skating. It was somewhere during this economic and participation boom on November 21st, 1991 to be exact, that a talented young athlete named Chris Edwards performed the first recorded frontside grind down a three-stair handrail. Rollerblading suddenly had a new icon and was about to capture the imagination of the television viewing world. By 1993, the global interest in freestyle rollerblading had spawned its own media source. Daily Bread magazine. Suddenly, the segment of inline skaters most misunderstood by the large corporations had a unified voice. Here, the unique culture of rollerblading was nurtured and cultivated, bringing together influential and persuasive skaters in search of artistic expression, which is exactly what they found. And of course, 94 is the year that everyone will hone in on, is the year that it, it grew up, that people from all around the world that had been skating for two or three years by themselves met each other and realized that, that we were part of a, a global entity. At the same time as the Southern California Rollerblade explosion, Rollerblade started showing up in New York City, specifically on MTV Sports. There's buses coming at you, you know, and you have to learn how to weave in and out of people. It's a tool of way, way of getting around. No, that was inline skating? That was too cool for me. I don't know. Are you into it? I'm into it. Through MTV, 
rollerblading had an unprecedented opportunity to beam directly into millions of homes around the world, which it did. By 1997, there were over 29.1 million inline skaters worldwide, nearly a tenfold increase in just eight short years. As the global population of rollerbladers continued to rise, the small group of participants using their skates in untraditional ways continued to grow. Eventually, through the influence of less than a handful of videos that had been released, the stunts being attempted by the alternative skating minority became more specialized, yet still very raw by today's standards. Nevertheless, these stunts caught the imagination of thousands of extreme sports athletic enthusiasts. And so, a video-centric culture was born. These videos were by no means instructional, but served as a means to communicate information to an audience, causing inspiration and motivation. Huge leaps for rollerblading culture occurred when California-based Video Groove released Dare to Air, thereby launching a would-be juggernaut, which drove the industry for many years, spreading the culture to all corners of the globe. Eventually, Video Groove would become the video series that made skaters' careers. Chris Edwards was the first skater we, we saw when um, Dare to Air came out. It was the first video we had seen of rollerblading, and we were like, it stripped us out because we were like, man, other people are doing what we're doing, you know? And we saw Edwards and we're like, man, this guy's doing it crazy. He's doing a flip over the car, which I'll never forget. And that's when I was like, man, I'm going to keep doing this, man. I'm going to get good at it, you know? Like, and that's when we got inspired to try flips and stuff in our backyard. On the opposite side of the skate video spectrum was T-Bone Films, best known for making Hoax and Hoax 2. Whereas Hoax was the video that propelled Arlo Eisenberg and Brooke Howard Smith into the spotlight, it was ultimately Hoax 2 that established an identity for skaters. Arlo, Michael Pollack, Brooke, Brian Smith and more toured the country in an RV and documented all their antics. This is when rollerblading standout personalities really got their start. To this very day, Hoax 2 is often cited by skaters as their favorite video, or at least the one that got them started. Actually, you know, after that video came out, you know, I just saw more skaters everywhere. That video spread out to so many people and motivated a lot of people to rollerblade. These new skaters were determined to replicate the tricks they saw performed on video, which led them to actually documenting their own exploits. The 40 ounce was straight out of Venice Beach. You know, AJ rocking it with his dreadlocks and tie-dye shirt, knee pads and stuff. A lot of that old school stuff from rollerblading you know, it wasn't always the coolest thing. Of course, AJ looked cool doing it just because he's AJ, you know, but like if any of us were going to do it, it'd be kind of more like a joke, you know? <laughs> we're like, man, let's get rid of these pads, you know, like they're uncomfortable and stuff. We're like, you know, it's kind of scary, you know, to get rid of your pads because everyone wore knee pads back in the day, you know, but that brought a whole new element to it, I think, too, because it made everyone relax. And without pads, you, you couldn't fall, so you wouldn't fall as much. So it brought a whole new smooth element to roll lighting. What all this really accomplished was planting the seeds of inspiration in other skaters to pursue their rollerblading interests. For many, this meant uprooting from their homes and relocating to Southern California, which is exactly the chain of events which brought together a group of individuals which will become responsible for the de facto image of 90s rollerblading culture, the Senate. I'm pretty sure we all had a, a vague plan to move to California and become rollerbladers, but I didn't have a long-term plan. We accidentally started seeing it. You know, Alan and I were kind of just drawing on things and we came up with a fake company. I mean, a lot of people don't know this. The Hoax was a fake movie. It's why it's called The Hoax. It was just us filming stuff and we'd tell people, yeah, we're, we're making a movie. And, and, and eventually it turned into a real movie and of course eventually Senate turned into a real company. We started seeing it at the end of 1993. We made about, I think it was like $1,700. When I got on Senate, they were making the grind plates in their garage. In 1996, Senate sold 750,000 t-shirts. That's not including the wheels and the, the bearings and the hard goods. And in 1996-97, we made 13 and a half million dollars. That money had become like unreal to us. It was an abstract concept. Whatever we wanted to do, we did. He's right. Senate made things happen for rollerblading. Now tonight, the story of an inline skating company and its motto. Inline skating is hot here locally. Many companies like to reflect an aggressive edge, a competitive toughness, if you will. But the motto for this company has people saying they've gone too far. David Cruz in studio tonight. He's got more. David? Paul, when the company came up with the slogan, Destroy All Girls, they saw it as a marketing gimmick. 
But tonight, that slogan is sparking a marketing mess among some people who say it sends the wrong message. The slogan appears on the back of the label sewn into the collar of the clothes, so you have to look hard to find it. So to destroy all girls, you know, you'd think that would destroy the company by doing something like that. But it had the opposite effect. So I made the hang tag, and for me, I make it fun, and it's like you're writing, you know, machine wash coal, and it's like, what the F? And then I put something on there. I actually think I put, kill your parents, or shave your head, kill your parents. And of course, because we both have really great parents that we love, I was upset, and that was the kind of the... Well, there were, right, there were limits how far, I mean, because some of the ideas were very provocative. We expected it to ruffle a few feathers, but certainly nowhere to the extent that it has. Every mom in the United States is going to see that and, and raise hell about it and bring it to the media. There was a very good reason that it, was, that it blew up so quickly. It's because it went out on the AP wire and every news outlet picked it up. But in 24 hours, I mean, the phone was ringing off the hook. CNN, MTV, NBC, ABC. Every and local news outlet. So within 24 hours, rollerblading had a, an edge to it and, and, and had a name associated with it, Senate. Now the company says it is now producing the new season line and that they will not use the destroy all girls slogan on the new labels. But they're not making any apologies either. And so we didn't know anything about being a fashion company. We don't know about making clothes or making a line or any of that stuff. And so we're guessing and we're just bullshitting our way through it. Because it was this intense kind of like this sequence of events that led to us doing very, very And well. by the way, when Brooke says that we made 750,000 t-shirts and the company was doing $13 million, people assumed that we made out like we cashed out. We're millionaires now just living off of Senate. But I'm by no means rich. What happened is, well, first of all, we didn't own the company. We so, did in the beginning. Yeah, when we, it was, sold, we sold it when it, when it was worthless. But then when we sold out... It made a lot of money. The crazy part of that, and being that young, was that you would make these things. We'd put them on a computer and then there was such a huge corporation behind us that, you know, a couple of weeks later there'd be a warehouse full and it was a very big warehouse. I don't think we have ever had a true accurate sense of the scope of the things that we did. The one saving grace that we had at Senate was that we always had uh, creative freedom, complete creative control of the company. We were owned by Bravo, but we could do whatever we wanted. So we do destroy all girls, and all those creative decisions we were free to make on our own and succeed or fail on, but really because we could do no wrong. Brooke and Arlo turned their experiences into products aimed at allowing rollerbladers to express some sort of agenda, and it worked. Not only generating millions in sales for the company, but in propelling Senate, rollerblading, and our unique sense of humor into the mainstream news spotlight. The things that I created never fit that mold of let's let's bring this to the mainstream, let's put it on TRL sort of thing. Um, and I felt like a lot of the companies that tried to copy Senate in what they were good at in being able to blanket almost every category really failed miserably. Senate was really the only company that pulled it off. 95, 96, K2 really started putting the gas on. They had a really innovative skate. And um, you know, at the time, Rollerblade was doing well. They had their new products. Everyone kind of had these new, fresh products that really shaped the industry. And people were competing with each other and trying to outmarket each other. And that led to a real big expansion. And I remember working at K2, and the numbers were really big, you know, on all the skates. At the time, K2 was the biggest. Uh, inline skate manufacturer and then over the years I just saw things kind of slow down and that's basically when I knew that I needed to kind of get out on my own and, and take my vision and, and trying to make what I thought would be rollerblading happen. Throughout the early 90s it seemed as if rollerblading could do no wrong and by all accounts it didn't. Just look at all the attention from Hollywood and Madison Avenue. Even before we destroyed all the girls, there was Prayer for the Roller Boys in 1991 with Corey Haim and Patricia Arquette. We are the new generation, and we are the remedy. We are the new family that cares. The Roller Boys care. Airborne the movie, featuring Jack Black and Seth Green in 1993. X Games in 1995, MTV Sports. Hey, you know what we're gonna take a look at right now? Inline skating. You ever do it down at the beach? Oh, no, let's go watch. You came down to visit me one time. We were gonna try it, but we decided uh, we decided against it. MTV Sports and Music Festival. England. All the sports together. You got skateboarding, BMX, freestyle, even motocross. 
Sometimes when you get all the athletes together, especially the inliners, you get kind of a volatile mix. As well as a bunch of our industry's most veteran skaters jumping over the now governor of California in full costume for Batman and Robin. Even a clutch dialogue line in the movie Liar Liar from 1997. No, I was for rollerblades. Made highlight of the then booming sport of rollerblading. Those were the times when rollerblading was almost as omnipresent as skateboarding and BMX, at least in terms of marketing placement. Did rollerblading deserve so much attention? Well, it depends on who you ask. All those movies, you know, Batman Using Us, um, Airborne, they made a Hollywood stereotype attempt and they just used us as a vehicle. But they didn't really talk about us. They didn't really show us the way that we know we are. You gotta have an agent in LA, it's vital. The people who stick together and stick with it through these hard times, it's really gonna pay off because we're the ones that really care about rollerblading, you know, like some people quit over the years and companies have gone away, but it's like the ones that are going to be there in the, for the long haul, like it's, it's all going to pay off. The dedicated skaters he's talking about have maintained their enthusiasm, a defiant act of self-affirmation. This is the same do-it-yourself ethos as the 1970s punk rock movement or any other youth movement of the 20th century. Disenfranchised youth becoming involved with the cause or community they believe in bucking the system and popular opinion to focus on their own specialized interests. It's like a subculture within a subculture within a subculture and like and then you see all this this uh, the extreme sports growing and being coming becoming more popular and being, being you know accepted by the mass culture and then it's just like there's rollerblading this little dot in the back in the corner that's like these other subcultures have pushed to the side. So it's like it makes us this elitist group of of you know these kids that actually care about something and they're doing something, they've committed their lives to something. If we can showcase that freedom at its like purest because that's ultimately what's it expressing is that individual freedom. These are the seeds of defiance as a socially positive characteristic, character building at a subconscious level. It's real, you know what I'm saying? It's not just about putting skates on our feet. It's a lifestyle. It is brought to extermination. A group of people with original interest and concepts, one of which would go on to change street skating across all the disciplines. And that was the IMYTA, originally known as the I Match Your Trick Association, the brainchild of John Julio, Mike Wilson, Ezekiel Anderson, and more. It's the biggest international real street contest in the world. It's hard to describe unless you're there, because when you're there, you can feel the vibe, hear people talking and cheering you on and, and pushing people and, you know, get that shit. It only makes it better that it's in real urban areas, you know, the biggest rails, the biggest ledges, it's just real street. Craziest tricks that have been done, you know, on eight wheels have gone down at one of the IMYT events, which helps just push the whole sport in general. In 2000, outside the San Francisco X Games, the IMYTA held its first event, a raw and skater judge street contest. The response was huge. Hundreds, if not thousands of skaters and spectators crowded each spot. And in those hours, an international rollerblading phenomenon was born. What was originally launched as a collective protest towards the restrictions of the X Games and similar contests would soon go on to become adopted by those very organizations. But don't think the IMYTA got any credit when the X Games decided to start having their own real street contests. Meanwhile, outside of the rollerblading bubble, there are energies being committed to perpetuating the rollerblading as lame myth. Can I trust you? Before MTV discovered Jackass, Big Brother Skateboarding Magazine was doing society's dirty work. And when it came time to publishing their 69th issue, they decided it would be the worst issue Can ever. I trust you? And it was. There was a Benihana air done over two or three 300 pound women covered in fake blood. Can I trust you? The reason any of this is important here is because in that same issue was an interview by Big Brother's editor-in-chief Dave Carney with Arlo Eisenberg. The premise? Dave and his henchman Chris Naraka were crocodile hunting Arlo as he skated spots. When he'd land a trick, they'd tackle him like the late great Steve Irwin. Even the captions were references to Irwin's particular manner of speech. Truthfully, it was a beautifully satirical piece, but not many rollerbladers knew about it when it went down. Can I trust you? Furthermore, this sideshow was accompanied by editorial in which Arlo was asked questions designed to humiliate and embarrass. 
What it showed, though, were two things. One, that Arlo has a pretty damn good sense of humor to go along with something so obviously designed to make him look bad, and with the potential to really add more insult to Rollerblading's already injured ego. And two, that guys like Carney and Big Brother really were concerned with making Rollerblading look bad. I used to skateboard. I felt like I was a part of a community that was sort of like dissatisfied, angry with something. And skateboarding expressed it not just through the act of skateboarding, but also the art. It was just this whole culture. And it was unconventional. And so now, to be hated, just because of what I do, it's disappointing. And and not only that, but the way the way that they would disrespect us, that's disheartening. My idols, the, the people that created this counterculture model, more than anyone else, anyone that participates in action sports, we are all following skateboarding's lead. Yeah, I think part of the animosity originated from the fact that rollerblading was really big. We were taking skateboarders and they were turning into rollerbladers and kids were starting out rollerblading instead of skateboarding. And so they saw this as a threat to their industry and so of course they're gonna they're gonna rag on it and try and beat it out. Beat it into little kids that it's not cool. It's really up to whoever's doing it to decide whether or not it's whack. Rollerblading is undeniably fucking amazing. Like, the tricks that are being done and shit like that is just ridiculous. And to any human eye, you know, you can't deny it. Despite having a turn the other cheek, let me do my thing, you do yours attitude in the face of all this negativity from outsiders, it was only a matter of time before something came of it. Newer than skateboarding, newer than BMXing, so I guess it's gotta take its fair share of getting beat up before it gets respected. Obviously this core group believes in something, they're doing it, you know, they're not gonna stop doing this. It's, uh, it's, they've been tortured. We've been, like, I mean, literally tortured. You go to a bar, you sit at a bar, someone finds out you're a rollerblader, you're either gonna get into a fight, or you're gonna have to scoot over a chair, or it's, it's, especially here in San Diego. I have scars to show for that, for the time where I stood up for rollerblading. It's not standing up, it's, it's, it's not even dealing with it, knowing that you're so above it. You get to that point. That's the, the point that our industry's gotten to, is we're so above it already. 2001 to present has been trying times for all the fruit booters, gay bladers, inliners, aggressive skaters, rollers, and bladers that prefer to refer to themselves as skaters. Except for the confusion that causes because most people assume you mean skateboarder. As an industry, it's unfortunate and, and it puts us at a disadvantage that we don't have a specific label for what we do for our sport. Uh, when I first got involved with it, it was being dubbed aggressive skating, which was a new term um, that Arlo and all these pioneers of the sport uh, decided they wanted to call it in order to, to differentiate it from the other types of rollerblading, whether it be hockey or speed or dance. Um, and so we all we're really proud of that name. But like with anything, like with styles and fashion and trends and different cycles, these things kind of become goofy after a while. And eventually, there was sort of a stigma about aggressive skating. It was like we were trying too hard to differentiate ourselves. So aggressive skating had a backlash against it, and people went back to, well, we're rollerbladers. So generally speaking, people that don't really worry about the classifications, someone like my dad or your dad or something would just say you're a rollerblader. I think it's rollerblading. It's obvious. It's like, that's our name. So we revert back to the original name that we all swore we hated so long ago, rollerblading. The word rollerblading is a trademark used in reference to a particular brand of inline skates. That company owns the words rollerblade and rollerblading, but the dictionary classifies rollerblader and rollerblader as nouns, which is a smart move. Smart because that's the word a majority of people use to describe the act of being one who enjoys inline skating. By late 2004, the most core rollerblading population, perhaps not even a tenth of the 17.3 million participants claimed by the Sporting Goods Manufacturers Association, has aged. These individuals have continued to be active in rollerblading despite being ostracized in their local area, as well as on a broad, mass-marketed scale. An important step for a community in need of a strong foundation. These self-formed outcasts have aged, stuck through the trends of the times, and established against all attempts otherwise the image of the impervious rollerblader. The one rollerblader who skates with 10 skateboarders and bikers because they recognize his talent. They are supposed to hate him, but they make a concession because of skill and ability. Proof that a myth condemning a sport can only last so long in face of that sport's ever-evolving difficulty and amplitude. Eventually, talent and sheer athleticism break through stereotypes. I respect what they do, you know, and they, they seem like they keep pushing the sport. It is gaining unspoken respect in the eyes of its most serious critics, 
because he's going through the same growing process the other alternative or action sports did years before. Scenes are starting to grow too. Small towns and big cities alike are bringing up new crews of bladers. The overall impression is that rollerblading is unpopular, but not going anywhere. The relative skill of the upcoming skaters improves too when compared with the professionals. The ability gap is closing, which both helps the community by ensuring better representation to the public, but also negatively in that it confuses the bladers who seek sponsorship or recognition from a starved industry struggling to meet its own ends. Then in 2004, a grading reality check. The rollerblading street skating event is removed from the American X Games, forcing a slow ripple throughout the rollerblade industry. I've been announcing the X Games, okay? I go and I do the play-by-play -play for the TV broadcast with Mark Shays. And every year before we go to the X Games, they have a, what they call a talent meeting. We go into the conference room and the guy, Rich Feinberg, the producer, says, listen, I had my staff put together this video of highlights from last year's X Games. I think it's really great and I think it's gonna get everyone fired up. They put in the tape, turns down the lights, and they never show rollerblading. They we're part of this staff, we're part of the X Games. Rollerblading hadn't been dropped yet. And Rich goes on with the, the presentation. He's talking about this stuff. He's talking about the new technology. And he says, we've got some really great new technology this year. We're gonna have the cable cam coming over the whole street course. And he's talking about the different things. And he says, and we're going to do something new this year that we've never done before. He said, so we're gonna have a follow cam to show on the street course. He said, but I gotta tell you guys, and he's now talking to the whole room. He said, I gotta tell you guys, uh, we tried everything, thought about a lot of different ways to get this, and it just so happens that the best way to get the footage is by having an inliner on the course. Just so you know, skateboarders, he's talking to the skateboarder and commentators, you know there's gonna be an inliner out there, just so you know bike riders. And basically, he's apologizing for the fact that there's gonna be an inliner on the course. They all had a big laugh about it. I didn't think it was funny. And then half a year later, six months later, I get an email from ESPN. One line basically says, we have decided to go in another direction. I mean, you would think if they cared about rollerblading, that they would want people there who cared about rollerblading. They want to have the best product they can have. They want the people there for skateboarding to care about skateboarding. My enthusiasm for rollerblading, my feelings for rollerblading, can only make their end product better. I want it to look good for them. What hurt me most was their response to me only confirmed what I knew all along, that they don't care about rollerblading. A year later in 2005, vert rollerblading is removed from the X Games as well. Sales hit all time lows, marketing budgets shrink, and optimism is outgunned by caution. Combined, participation drops, already scarce outside marketing dollars become scarcer. In the meantime, rollerblading participation and visibility continues to rise in Europe and Asia through other X Games venues and action sports tours. Very rarely are contests in the U.S. Like the last probably four or five contests I've been to have been out of the country. <laughs> It used to be like so many times when I was a kid, like rollerblading would come on TV and you just hurry up and get a tape, you know, you'd push record because it was awesome, you know, they had misses, they would have everything, they have ASA contests, and now it's like we've just been so pushed to the outside, like outcasts, that everybody forgot about it. But it hardly matters to the professionals whose meager salaries are slashed, the morale shattered. Aaron Feinberg just got fired from his sponsor. One of the greatest rollerbladers we have in the history of our sport of all time, he can't even get paid. He can't even get thrown a bone from his sponsor because there's no money in this industry. And when people say, cool, it's cool that we're underground, I say, fuck that. This does nothing to help the pattern of elder talent leaving the industry in pursuit of loftier exploits coupled with financial security. This not only hurts the historical significance of the sport, but removes the bulk of an elder demographic from the leadership position, leaving only younger and less experienced individuals behind to repeat mistakes made by their predecessors. Like most people my age aren't even in it anymore. Maybe they're working a job that they hate and they're not skating. Like, it's like, what did it get them? Like doing something they love, what did it get them? So it makes them like jaded about skating again. And we got real life deals. It's like, you got, you got pay bills, you got, you know, 
girlfriends or, or just everyday stuff that you have to pay for. And now, yeah, now a lot of us wish that we saved our money. A lot, a lot of us wish that, you know, we were more responsible. And, but in the day though, like, we all appreciate it more now these days. I, I do, being around the game for so long. In, in rollerblading today, the industry is so small that the money is just not there like it used to be. Average salary is like between fifteen and eighteen thousand dollars a year, and having to pay for insurance and rent on top of all that because I mean there's no benefits with a dating career. Most companies, if you skate for them, they don't provide health care, and if they do, you know they're doing something special. They're doing something good. Hopefully, you know if you get lucky, you can get enough cash per, you know, as a salary per month to pay for a third party. Imagine if we had the exposure we had ten years ago. You know, imagine what we could do with it now. I would definitely be in a different position. You know, I, I wouldn't be struggling to eat on tour. I wouldn't be eating ramen three meals a day, 13 cents. Put my game right now and I'm eating ramen. When I was barely first starting, I would go to a competition and make $10,000. I didn't even know what to do with the money because I was so young. I'm 24 years old, I have one more year until I'm off my parents' insurance and I can't seem to stop what I'm doing. I'm too in love with what I do. Roll wedding has me in, in its grip. The community rolls forward, thanks to the steadfast dedication of a handful of core companies and the continuation of specialized media outlets like Daily Bread in the US, BMAG from Austria, Crazy Roller in France, and more. Some of these titles are gone now, more fallen soldiers in a long and seemingly endless battle for respect. It just sucks right now. We just have to stick through these hard times. And, you know, can't be buying expensive cars or owning houses and stuff like that, but maybe someday. In 2006, the period of denial for rollerbladers is past. We've accepted our position as outsider. We know no one cares about what we are doing or who our top professionals are. Money is hemorrhaging out of the industry still, yet new and more educated leaders continue to emerge. Members of the old guard such as Arlo Eisenberg have said these times are the most important. This banishment from action sports, our, our exile, is really has been the greatest blessing. Because what happened is skateboarding got so big that really it became mainstream. The cool kids at school are wearing skateboard gear. They really have become the jocks. I mean, they, they, they're the ones dating the cheerleaders. They're the, now the cheerleaders are the girls. The whole thing is switched. Alternative is the mainstream. The hottest girls at school are wearing black. So now you can't really go to school and be a skateboarder and be the outcast. You don't have that experience anymore. We are the skateboarders from 20 years ago. We're the ones that go to school with a rollerblading t-shirt or carrying your skates and you get ostracized. You get made fun of. You're the roller fag. You're the fruit booter. But at the end of the day, they will have gone through a struggle for something that they believe in and that they love. And when it all comes back around, when people do start to say, you know what, that's cool, that's impressive, and God willing, the money comes back into the sport, and they put it back on TV, we'll know that the people that are there at the top representing the sport will have paid their dues and are people that we are proud to have representing rollerblading. There's even more to the story. All the bad press, all the negative stigma, all the efforts of a culture falling short of aspirations, it all amounted to an overwhelming sense of jaded destiny, which was complete bullshit. Behold the power of suggestion, a placebo effect made real. Just look at the numbers. In 1995, inline skating had 23.9 million people strap up skates and go skating more than twice. Today, those same research techniques suggest inline skating has numbers closer to 13.1 million people a number even today slightly greater than skateboarding. Our industry has declined since its booming heyday, but the interest is still there, just as strong as in other sports. In fact, more than snowboarding, more than mountain biking, and more than tennis. Not every one of these skaters is a top professional or aspires to be anything other than recreational, and neither does the tennis enthusiast or the mountain biking novice or the snowboarding retiree. But the numbers count the same for them, earning those sports attention from major sponsorship dollars, endorsements, and widespread media exposure. Rollerblading is not treated as a valuable marketing commodity by the public because it has never stood up for itself as a culture that was above or truly beyond the cultural stigmas which have rampantly preceded everything, at least not until now. There is no answer to where we're gonna go and what's gonna happen to us. As long as everybody fucking believes in it, it's gonna go somewhere.
Because I fucking get on a plane every other weekend and go to third world countries and do fucking demos for God knows who out there, you know, for a fucking reason. I think it's the same reason that every kid wakes up in the morning and puts on his skates. We have a movement where there's an awareness of rollerblading that people realize that skating is what you want it to be. It's something that comes from within inside you. I think it's important for kids to realize what kind of sacrifice people are making to better our industry. And I'm excited to see the people who stick it out because those are the people with the creative vision that have the heart, that have the integrity to stick with something they love and get past the fact that it's not about the money, it's not about being famous. You know, we're all lost souls trying to figure out what we're gonna do to keep the dream going. Once people start realizing that it's not something that you're gonna be automatically judged for participating in, negative or positively by the participants, then I think a lot more people will start coming into rollerblading. Everybody's responsibility at this point in the game is to make sure that we're cultivating the next generation. Back in 96, it was easy, it was on TV, you know, people, it was on the streets, it was in people's mouths, you know. Nowadays, it's, it's so underground, it's so driven down that it's hard for kids to find it. And now the task comes to showing these consumers what possibilities lie in the wheels beneath their feet. The crossover is and has been happening for some time. Rollerblade and other companies offer sub $80 price point skates with aggressive skate features such as sole plates and H blocks. It is an exciting time for rollerblading because change is the only constant of the times. Everything is changing. And for a sport long thought dead, change can only lead up. I really feel that over the years, people have made the mistake of defining the success of rollerblading in terms of money. And it's people think, okay, when there's lots of money in the sport, rollerblading's doing great, and when the money falls out, though, rollerblading died. But the fact of the matter is that rollerblading has been consistently progressing since the day it began. And that the level of tricks, the amount of style, the innovations in hardware and skate technology, everything's been progressing since day one. As long as there are people breathing, someone will be rollerblading. We don't need to worry about the sport. I think it's progressing more now than in millions of people are doing it. No longer occupied by posturing for public opinion, rollerblading culture has matured into a level of self-awareness that displays both strength and diversity. Cultural, economic, and social barriers are greatly minimized within the shroud of the community. A vast network of friends and acquaintances across the country and globe creates a true sense of unity. At one time, you know, rollerblading had sort of a central brain trust, you know, it was like Daily Bread and Sin and all these things came out of one central area. And now we're in a different place. I mean, you know, Daily Bread is sort of transitioning into whatever and there are new magazines that are emerging and there are companies now that are spread all over, not just the country, but all over the world. And I think it puts us in a stronger position. Uh, some people say they long for the good old days. But now rollerblading is like it's like we've got these little Al Qaeda cells. And it's like each one. It's like now there's no head. There's no you know you can't cut off the head and kill rollerblading. It's like it's like it's got these little cells, these little communities of rollerblading that are each evolving and growing in their own right, sort of like cultivating their own little scenes. And it's the feedback loops that get created between those different communities and the way that they all sort of interact that are creating a new kind of rollerblading that's a reflection of a lot of different input. And that's the kind of natural process that makes something ultimately better than it ever could have been if it's just under the dictatorship, you know, one small collective. But being a rollerblader is much more than enjoying inline skating. Rollerblading became and has been a target for action sports slander for nearly 10 years. But the joke is about to take an interesting turn as the underappreciated and misunderstood underground global culture of rollerbladers is about to be exposed like never before. Some think it has already gone, but rollerblading is far from barely dead. Faster 
What's up? This is your boy FM, Frankie Morales, and you're watching Very Dead. I'm from the A where they drip paint, sip paint, out of Cinderella, y'all ain't know that sticky piss, thank you. I'm snake. from the city of days, just a deep stand, the cash is sniffing, sipping, and blasting, but not as steeping. I'm from the A where they drip paint, sip paint, out of Cinderella, y'all ain't know that sticky piss, thank you. I'm from the city of days, just a deep stand, the cash is sniffing, sipping, and blasting, but not as steeping. Whoa, shorty, your body under the seat, go swim with the shots, you're not in me. As a matter of fact, think about it, you're not in me. From the A where they drip paint, sip paint, out of cigarillo, y'all they know that sticky piss stink. From the city of day, there's a G thing, the cash is niggas slipping, the blast them and not as steep. Now where you from? I'm from the A, A up to the day, I heard them niggas be clowning, but we don't play. Now I'm gonna see you like Leo by that gun play. Now where they at? Put them out, I'm about to come straight. Wait a minute, come to post and take a ride with the kid, that's they fall for phony bitches, cause the plastic and bridge to all the hoes, you want my number, better suck them. Yeah, 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 it's fun as a bitch. Yeah, I got my bass on, but it look like Nikes. Got my skates on, skateboarders don't like me. Best one out the A, some say, yeah, probably. Y'all got time to play, not me or me, broccoli. Broccoli with cheese for she's. I need guapa, need the coppers, need choppers with bees to try to stop it. Cheating knockers ain't stopping the steeds. Proceed sloppily, releasing all of these, leave it easy, at least properly. I'm from the A, where they drip paint, sip paint, out of cigarillo, so they know that's it, keep this tank. I'm from the city of day, there's a G-Thing The cash is niggas slipping, the blast them and not as steepin' I'm from the A where they drip paint, sip paint Out of cigarillo, y'all know that sticky piss stink I'm from the city of day, there's a G-Thing The cash is niggas slipping, the blast them and not as steepin' Gotta stay cold, uh, I'ma be frozen Be in g Lotes, uh, be unique closing Cameras flashing, so your boy posing Mannequin, man, man, a man, a girl scoping Your camera, man, pan, but damn it, who knows I'm a ran in this damn land, suppose your boy chosen Your clan, your family, my leader knows broken You get it, you understand, you know the noise poison
I'm on fire, I'm on fire. Me too, me too. I'm on fire, I'm on fire. Me too, me too. I'm on fire, I'm on fire. Me too, me too. It keeps me safe when I sleep, still I keep awake What if my dream girl pays a midnight visit? I see the world through the scope, but I gain no insight with it When I get introspective, I put the safety on Make these songs with the biscuits sitting in my shaky palms I'm a man now, a real man Not the one who went to two colleges groveling over meal plans I'm staring at the ceiling fan, all wide-eyed Amazed by the ways the blades break the silence I used to be afraid of fire Unaware of the graphic nature of phallic symbols Tragically ironic Sucking off each other's gaps and pistols I got more back issues than guns and ammo Cause my Uzi weighs a ton And I never let go of the handle Hanging on the mommy's pant leg Double fisting Knee deep in shells Kicking ballistic Smash dick It's a detachable penis An extension of my manhood Position like a fetus An intravenous hookup feeds bullets to my magazine Never mind the bullets My pistol is a sex machine So you try to front, hold 
is it's dividing me The weight up on my shoulder blades grinds in me And if the scenery change I don't mean to act strange It's the pain that settles in like the rain Like the rain Like the rain